Our Highline Voices, 106.5 KQWZ LP FM. Connecting Highline and our region. Share your story. Our Highline Voices, history, cultural heritage, art, performances, contemporary, pop culture. We are very motivated to provide a vibrant community museum and authentic social gathering place. It truly takes a village to raise a museum. Despite the challenges, our daily inspiration is our eagerness to build a stronger and more connected community. This museum is from the community to the community. Our passion is for our visitors to have access to a broad spectrum of information sources and cultural perspectives. Our Highline Voices. Hi everyone, this is Nancy from the Highland Heritage Museum and welcome back. Uh, we are excited to have our next two guests uh, uh, coming with us tonight. And it's just a, a joy, a pleasure just to truly talk to people and get to know everyone little by little and who is working in our community. Um, once once again, why are we doing this is to make sure that uh, these voices are reaching out to people that outside of the museum. It's not just inside the museum walls, it's outside too. People who have accessibility issues, either uh, disabilities or transportation or don't trust museums or they're just in general, there are many different factors of why people might not be coming to museums. So we want to make sure that we are uh, cultivating those values and then that making it accessible and, and inclusive as we can. And this may this format is a different format, but we're playing with it. So thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. And then I'm going to let our guests introduce themselves and then we go into the questions. Are you ready? Awesome. We're ready. Okay. Go for it. Cool. I'm Joanne. I'll start. My name is Orion Grant, representing the Environmental Science Center here today. Um, again, thanks for the opportunity, Nancy. Thanks for all the folks who are listening. Um, and shout out to folks on YouTube in the future who get the chance to see this. So, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Joanna? Awesome. Yeah, my name is uh, Joanna Stodden, also with the Environmental Science Center. So yeah, thanks for being here and having this opportunity. Yeah, it is a pleasure. And it's the same. Thank you so much for being in in a space today. Um, we're going to dive a little bit more about who you are and what you do to the, um, what you do in general. I know that you work with the youth and I know that uh, I'm excited for everyone to know what you're doing. And so I'm just going to let you just be free and go for it. Just, just show us who are you? Sure. Sure. Uh, Joanna, did you want to go ahead and start? I, I'd love to share, but I'd let you have the floor first. Go ahead, Ryan. Go ahead. Okay. Well, yeah, this is, a, again, a great opportunity. It kind of complements the work that we do at the Environmental Science Center. Um, again, my name is Orion Grant. I uh, represent ESC as their teen restoration coordinator today. And um, really just thinking back on how I got here, um, how I brought myself to this beautiful community is just through that work with nature, um, not just connecting with the outdoor, um, outdoors rather through the environment, but also connecting with nature through um, restoration ecology, uh, understanding these kind of simple systems that, you know, we're all connected to, and also through uh, conservation. I originally was focused on uh, marine science in a kind of different way um, through fishing in Alaska. So um, this is a story I always bring up, but uh, I do that to remind folks that, you know, our stories are circuitous. We do overlap with one another, and we do sometimes come full circle. And uh, even though I didn't originally understand that you know, my future was about teaching and learning about these critters when it comes to the marine environment. Um, that's where I am now. So that's just kind of a brief about where I am and who I am. And aside from that, you know, the Environmental Science Center is a unique place where uh, folks from all walks can come and enjoy outdoor environmental ed and just conversations around um, earth sciences, in particular the beach. So um, it's really great great place to be really really unique group of people um always always having opportunities for more engagement uh, to meet our community in the field or in the classroom so uh, again my job is to maintain a, a good relationship with our community by providing really unique outdoor environmental ed opportunities and working with our teens and youth so I'll pass it to him awesome yeah thank you for that Overview, Orion. Um, so yeah, Joanna Stodden, and I grew up here in 
Seattle. I went to the Evergreen State College in Olympia and studied field biology and had the opportunity to do really cool uh, field work in rural Alaska, getting like helicopter in and float planes into these rural sites in Alaska, looking for, looking at large wood debris, looking at the rocks in the stream, studying the stream. Is this a good place for salmon to live? And also got to look for amphibians that are really sensitive to the water in the stream. Um, so if like the amphibians can be there, then we know that salmon can live there. So it was a really exciting and adventurous time of my life. Field work is also like really monotonous. You could be repeating the same prototype again and again and again. And it also can, it was all, for me, it was isolating. I was either out in the woods by myself or with like one other person for, you know, weeks on end. So I knew I wanted to work in the outdoors and, but I knew I wanted to be around more people too. So that's kind of how I found environmental education and um, worked for a number of environmental nonprofits in Kachemak Bay in Alaska aboard tall ships in school gardens and then um, actually found the Environmental Science Center when I was at the Mercer SLU. One of the educators there told me about ESC and uh, that was in 2009 and they haven't been able to get rid of me yet. Uh, we have an incredibly motivated a small but mighty and motivated team. It's just incredible. We see over 8,000 people each year. And then um, even more importantly, I just every day I'm inspired by the teachers and caretakers and our program partners in Highline who really see the value of going outside of the four walls of the classroom and into the outdoors. So they haven't been able to get rid of me yet. I just love this. Work. I just wanted to yeah, speak to that quick, Joanna. There's been no effort to remove Joanna from their position. <laughs> their seat, but they, they continue to do um, something that is really hard to do at any organization, which is challenge the uh, dynamics of, of power and challenge how um, power is shared at an organization. So again, Joanna, I don't tell you this enough, but I do need to say it on air. I'm very, very grateful that you are modeling an institution that is not only anti-racist, but inclusive in practice. And it's it's very hard to accomplish. Um, so much gratitude to you. And um, as long as you're willing to be with us, hopefully you will remain. So I just wanted to say thank you for that before we go on. I have uh, a question. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Nancy. No, is, is that it is a very interesting topic that you guys just stepping into it. And to me, um, Hearing you both, you both have very similar um, values as to why you're doing the work. And then also we share those, no similar, not same, but similar values of, of, of you know, even education and kindness and, 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 and then embracing each other and knowing that we co-share in the same space, that we co-share in the same a need for us to to connect with each other and with nature in, in, in many different levels. And so when it comes to creating a space that is uh, free of racism or prejudice or a, a space where you can cultivate kindness and compassion and empathy, a place where you can be humble enough to realize that, that you know, we have this amazing planet and, and, and we're just a little, 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 little grain in the universe. I mean, we're like, a little green in the universe and then it's just the idea of how do we how do we work with each other how do we uh, get together and, and share those values and and then not only share share them and just talking i'm done talking i'm honestly i've been talking about values for many years it's all about just actions at this point and i know that um that that's what it matters in the end that's it's, it's not a little statement with a frame it's about pulling a kid in inside and say, okay, this is your space. Okay, let's find something fascinating. Let's learn something cool. Let's feel comfortable. It's a place that you belong. It's a place that you can uh, really explore and, and then be curious. And so I admire the two of you for the how you work with the youth and how you instigate the people being curious about it, kids being curious about what is around us in a way that is safe. And so mm -hmm. thank you for, for the work that you do. And so... Uh, I'm like I say, I'm gonna try not to speak as much. I'm gonna uh -huh. go and oh, then and, and then just make sure that you mention all the cool projects that you are currently working to. Okay, go for it. So, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to just compliment, piggyback off that, Nancy. I'm just glad you brought that up. Like, I grew up, you know, camping and hiking with my family, and I think it's really important for me to remember every day that 
not everyone has had that experience. And that really is a goal of ours at ESC is to create safe and affirming um, outdoor classrooms. And, you know, we recognize that many communities in South King County have been excluded from safe, positive um, outdoor experiences. Um, so we, yeah, we strive to reduce barriers. We offer boots, rain gear, layers. We um, pay for transportation and um, the program is free for any school that qualifies, that has a school of 45% or more free and reduced lunch. And just and just every day are working really hard to, uh, I, I think that we have a lot, lot more room to grow and continue to work, but are really working hard to listen to our program participants and our community. Um, uh, to hear what's working and what we've continued to improve to make our outdoor classrooms um, feel even more comfortable and affirming. Absolutely. I you though, Ryan, yeah. No, no, that that definitely complements the what I've seen as our, our long-term plans, right, and our objective vision. Again, ESC does a great job of um, meeting on a regular basis with our staff and then, of course, with our board and also having um, the chance to receive feedback from the staff to shape the direction of the future, but it, it really goes back to our community. From what I've seen in the years that I've been here, we're, we're responding always to the feedback, um, to the input, to what data we can from our community to know how to, to treat them best, right? To know how to meet them. And um, yeah, at this point it feels like, yeah, that's that complements the long-term plans. Um, I think what your question, Nancy, was, you know, what are some of the things we're excited about? And um, what I'm looking for most, and Joanna and I talked about this yesterday, uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity with mentorship as it relates to our teens and youth uh, that we contact either through our programs or directly through my restoration um, ecology um, work. It'd be great to make a more robust opportunity for those students to step into um, either a position with the Environmental Science Center um, as a junior naturalist or in any other capacity in the environmental sciences or um, restoration ecology. So um, ESC is um, currently working on a plan to create a um, teen mentorship or kind of tutorship program um, that would hopefully, you know, take it a step further, right, beyond just our, our programming that we offer our students by creating a vessel for them to um, cultivate their relationship with the sciences and hopefully find either vocation or a career. Um, so. It's so one thing I'm really, really excited about, but I know we've got a lot of stuff in the works, Joanna. Oh yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And um, Orion is incredibly talented at connecting with our youth, and connect, especially with our teens. It's not all of our naturalists love working with the middle school and high school crowd. And sure. Orion's so great at meeting them, however they show up to the program that day. And um, they, have, they have a lot of fun, whether it's um, doing restoration work at Seahurst Park or um, at Salmon Creek or at Hilltop Park and one of our new projects. Um, but yeah, we're hoping to build off of those paid internship opportunities that we've started um, piloting in these last couple of years. Another thing that I've been really excited about in, uh, so we've been at Seahurst Beach right here in Beeren. If you had an oppor have an opportunity to get to Seahurst Beach, I highly recommend it. It's a gorgeous 170 acre park. Um, with a like a mile of coastline, second growth forest. So if you haven't op had an opportunity to see that treasure, I hope you can touch your first sea star, get squirted by your first clam. Um, but back in 2022, we expanded and we now have a second environmental hub right here in downtown Renton, which is pretty cool because um, for many reasons, but one of which is like a large part of our mission is increasing access to the outdoors. And Seahurst Park is gorgeous, but there's no public transportation that takes you there. So um, here we are right in downtown Renton, close to the Renton Transit Center, walkable from the Renton Community Center next to the Renton Library. But we also have this amazing salmon habitat of the Cedar River running right behind us with thousands of salmon returning to spawn. So it's it's been a cool move being in this urban area while also it's kind of uh, made many of us like rethink like what is an environmental center? You know, you think of like out on in the mountains of these rural areas that you you know have to have four wheel drive to get to. So it's been neat kind of rethinking um, what are environmental hubs. There's so much beauty, you know, even in these more urban areas. 
Um, and we've also really expanded our programs with our elders. So um, we started working more with Merrill Gardens in Berrien and the Renton Senior Center in Renton to do water quality and salmon programs. And it's been, it's been so neat. Many of the elders show up for every single one of our offerings. And I think so often environmental nonprofits focus on youth, you know, the next generation, which is so important, but it leaves our elders behind. So mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. been um, really wonderful to expand these partnerships. And I, um, if you thought, if you heard of Marvel Science Center and thought of like children's programming, I encourage you all to check out our website. We have much more adults and um, elder programming that's, that's all free to our community. I got a couple of questions for you. One, yeah. um, it is my, it might sound a bit weird question, but what is mentorship? You know, when you talk about the word mentorship, and if you're talking to kids, um, well, what does that mean? You know, that's, that's one. And then two, there's a comment on, um, yes, I think that inclusion is not just racial inclusion or, or, or any other areas. It is all of it combined. It is the age, is yeah, you know, that intergenerational um, component. It is the disability, sexual orientation, uh, religion, and, and all and on and on. And so when talking about those values of inclusion, yeah, age is one of them, you know, is the ability to 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 know that we are having those conversations with adults and then older generations, but why are we having a young, uh, a young ones and then have that really beautiful interconnection with all the different generations to actually create a movement, create a, uh, an environment that everyone is able to talk and share regardless of the age. And, and so not it's great that, that you're promoting that, um, but going back to my weird question, what is mentorship oh. to you? And so I'm going to just grab the ball and try it at you. Okay, what's mentorship? Yeah. Yeah, I think of it in three different phases. Um, probably the most important is like creating the framework or the scaffold for a mentorship program. So either it be a curriculum, um, a place and space where the students meet, um, other partners, outlining what the program is and how it might uh, possibly impact youth, students, um, is probably most important, along with knowing what youth and students that you're going to be working with so you can tailor that for them. I think second would be um, modeling um, how to do the work that you're talking about, not just in the field with the ecology or with the actual um, process of restoration or whatever it looks like, but uh, modeling, uh, being on time, um, being presentable, um, communication, the types of skills that students will have to use, of course, not just in their professional lives, but in their personal lives. Um, and then last is tracking for me. Um, once a student has completed the program or completed a project, um, being able to either keep them in a cohort or be able to have a way of communicating with them and hopefully seeing them on a regular basis, either a, you know, a monthly or annual meeting where we get back together, share our stories and our successes. Um, and hopefully those uh, students who've gone through the program can possibly mentor new students so, of course, we're still in the planning phase for something like this, but I do think the three main steps, of course, are creating the framework, uh, modeling, uh, you know, just how to do the program right, and then finally tracking the students when they've completed a program, personally. Okay, yeah. Um, English is my second language. And so um, one thing that I've been learning through the interviews and through my career, I guess, is that, you know, there's some terms that took me years to understand mm. um and in and, and then i'll hear it in, in different contexts and that's how you know it's like connecting it does oh that's what that means and mm. now with cell phones it's easier to just like da -da -da. <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's that's the meaning of it mm. um but like for example in mm. one of my interviews i this the mm. guests were talking a lot about sustainability and I know what that means, but then also English is a second language and, and people just learning and, and, and being, you know, understanding the, the different terminologies and how it's been used in different uh, areas. But mentorship, it could be used in many different ways. And, and I just wanted to hear from you what that means and, and um, either from a technical point of view or from a values, um, you know, your values as to, you know, the idea of what is a mentor and, and just being able to 
to give that care and that, that hug. To me, that's what it is. It's somebody who can hug you, like come here over and then we're going to do it together. That's to me, that's, mm. that's what it means, uh, mentorship. But um, from hearing it from a very technical perspective, for many years, it took me a long time to understand. It's just that. It's just somebody pulling you over, hugging you. And here we are. We're going to be doing this together. So that's the reason yeah. why I ask you that weird question. Um, no, Nancy, I, I just want to speak to this, that real um, quick. Um, installation yeah. on mentorship. Go ahead, Ryan. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's important. I think, Nancy, one of the things that um, ESC looks for when it comes to hiring naturalists and hopefully retaining staff or people who have not only passion for environmental ed, but who are passionate about one another, about people. Um, I do believe, and I've seen, you know, with our programs, even though they're not fully fleshed out mentorship programs, whenever we have teens that connect with a program or a project, um, they'll share things, anecdotes, stories about themselves that are incredibly sensitive and require a lot of trust. Um, so I think by default, you know, speaking again to the kind of values element of mentorship, it's about being able to receive students wherever they're at in their lives and, and, and being able to have these kind of conversations, maybe in the field, but, you know, maybe aside so that they can understand, you know, it's a process of opening up, sharing, growing in community. So I appreciate you just bringing that up because there, there's, there's some points about mentorship that most folks, they need to recognize it's it's about holding a community holding youth sometimes through their hardship or through their challenges and um, knowing how to support them or knowing how to sometimes say hey i can't have help you with this or i don't have the skills for this but here's where we can look so um, joanna if you had anything else i'd love to hear i just wanted to share that bit no the, the only thing i'm thinking of is um when you were talking about like definitions earlier nancy is that you know because all our programs are free we have to write so many grant reports after our program so a large part of this is asking students you know what they learned and we um often ask like what does restoration mean to you or what does sustainability mean to you so it's me hearing them kind of piece together what they've learned in our programs, but also what they've learned from their, you know, adults at home or their community to really um, provide like a wholesome explanation of that word to them. Yeah. yeah, yesterday I was doing an interview and it was a sensitive topic. It was about uh, foster um, kids mm -hmm. and, and the hardship that the kids go through and, and how, um, yeah, it was a, a harsh no harsh. It was uh, a sensitive topic because you you had to be in a vulnerable position to say yes. It is a reality. There are, there are many kids that are struggling, don't have those tools, don't have that mentorship, don't have that that mm -hmm. person who can make them feel safe and welcome. And and, and not just that, I, and a, a person who can educate them and, and and ignite that exploration in them to understand what's going on around them. And so. In less than 24 hours, you know, I'm talking to two different people that are working directly with the youth and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it is just the, at the end of the day, we everything is intertwined. Everything is together. Mm -hmm. It's not just the school sector or the science sector or, or the, his, the cultural sector. It's all of us. All of us are on the same place. All of us are, I mean, go share in the same space in the sense mm -hmm. that we're here together and and so how do we move forward and to make sure that is something that we can reach to make it a more meaningful community um but more like i said you guys need to push me back just just yeah. i'll go back to you um and so you have um i can tell that you guys had the heart um action speaks that in the words and but i also see the way you energies that you come across and it just be truly authentically caring um do you have, uh, you mentioned that that's what you do at work. And so is your caring expense outside of the work that you do? Meaning is your family also involved in, in ecology and environmental and in and, and, and the, it's just you and your family or do you actually have an extension of what you do through work and then in the community? So I'm just wanting mm -hmm. to make sure that people also it's a little bit of sense of who you are, not just as a, a professional hat, but as also as a whole holistic human being that extends and goes in and out from work to community. And, and it's just that, or maybe I'm just talking nonsense, but I just wanted to ask that question. Yeah, it's crazy talking, Nancy. Um, we, we 
I mean, how I'll speak for myself. Um, the Environmental Science Center is a way to complement the community, the passions, the other like, things I care about in my life. So when I leave ESC, I usually will step into, you know, um, I'll step into a community of urban farmers. Um, I have another organization based in Seattle that focuses on um, urban farming and food justice. And just like you had said, Nancy, everything that we do in our community is connected. It's not a stretch. It might be hard for some folks to see, but once they understand the overlap, the, the connections, it's really, it's really clear. Um, you know, in our watershed, you know, when our water starts up from a high point and moves down through a low point, it's going to pass through these communities. It's going to go through the Renton Highlands. It's going to go through, you know, South Seattle, eventually passing through Burien area and emptying it out into the Puget Sound. And all along the way, it gets a chance to um, come in contact with these different members of our community who may or may not know that they're connected. So, um, again, you know, the work I do outside of ESC mostly focuses on urban farming. Um, we talk a lot about our connection to the um, global watershed or maybe our, our, our global systems, basically, when it comes to water. But in, environmental science um, is a unique field because it has a it, it just has this propensity to connect people um, from different communities or from different organizations. So, yeah, I think that it's just a, it's always been a hub, of course, for education and for knowledge, but it just is a unique place where I see these different communities overlapping and saying, oh, you work with who, or oh, we work together and just finding these bonds. Yeah, I think that for me, ESC is going to be a place, hopefully um, into the future that I continue to um, use as a platform for education. But even in, if I step away from ESC or in the future, if um, work takes me in a different direction, um, I'll always look to the center as a place of connection, a place where community can come together and, and find resources. So That's great. I like it. I like how um, it's not just an office a wall space mm -hmm. that is that you know it, it is the same thing in different formats once you walk into a different space but it still mm -hmm. have that essence of 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 caring and justice and um mindfulness of what is around us so mm -hmm. joanna it's now it's your turn <laughs> yeah no i like the idea of connectivity and it's it's neat like you know every fall during this this 10 week period, you can see so many salmon in the Cedar River. And, you know, we're so lucky now, one of our offices is right next to that river, but just going back to that river uh, every year and seeing faces that, you know, I've seen for the last 20 years all brought together by salmon fighting for their very last breath to lay their eggs is incredible to me. It really is a, a, something that connects us all, like from, from youth, I think. But, and for me, like I fell in love with, um, experiential ed and or hands-on education when I was eight years old I was I was not a great student I like had ADD and would love the distracting my friends from the topics they were doing and um the and was getting getting terrible grades was like spent most of my time in the timeout corner and my parents my mom was an educator and she was like it's not you it's this model so she took me out of the classroom and put me in an experiential um, elementary school where I just like fell in love with learning. You know, our LA topics were writing letters to the salmon in the salmon tank and our science labs were out in the garden. And I just went from like thinking I was awful at school and hated learning to absolutely falling in love with learning. So that's really um, where, how I've come to this work and it's been neat seeing, I was just sending Orion some photos from last night. I was at Constellation Park during the low tide with my, with my three-year-old. And um, it's been really neat seeing how, um, how he's come to love. And, you know, not always like I do, but <laughs> come to love these outdoor experiences as well. It's uh, for the first time, I feel like he was, like on it, you know, it's hard working on the beach. It's rocky, it's muddy, it's slippery. And um, I've had to like carry him a lot in the past, but this last night he was pointing out the animals to me and was on his own two feet. So it was definitely a moment of, of pride seeing him feel more comfortable in the beach habitat and um, enjoy being out there and enjoy different modules of learning in that way. Absolutely. There's one thing that I'm, I'm very naive 
um, I'm very young in many different ways and very immature in other ways too. Um, but on my perception is noting that, um, you know, when you have this, you wake up, you have this sense of going to work and then doing your work and depending on what work that is, you know, if you into financial stuff and into corporation stuff and, and all this, it's almost like you are not as attuned to what's around you. You're more attuned as to what's going on globally in a sense of money and words and conflicts and issues. And, and it's all about, you know, you know, power and I don't know. I feel that there are specific fields that uh, numbs you from being conscious about environmental um, issues and, and it really numbs you from switching your your eyes for a moment and look at it like, wait a second, yes, the water is important and salmon is important, the environmental is important, it's not just the money or the corporation or of all this, you know, I, I feel that, um, and I'm not saying that I'm against the people. <laughs> Because I'm sure there's a lot of people that are going to be listening to this, but it just, I hope it's also an invitation to realize that it's a, a whole thing. It's not just one side and the idea that we coexist. And in this beautiful habitat, um, I'm from Mexico City. And so I grew up in this crazy jungle, no trees, all cement jungle. Mm -hmm. And the, the habitat there is absolutely bananas. And so coming to this area where you see this beautiful combination of of rivers and mountains and oceans and in well seas and and in in forest and it's just this amazing breathtaking beauty um that I do hope that people in the communities are not just so focused on work and so focused on on other areas but they can also be more appreciative and be more responsible take that responsibility that we do need to have a responsibility on all the resources that we take and then uh, the consequences of us doing that and, and then being able to have some type of values to the little ones. Okay, now it's your I turn. Have uh, to, we have, no, Nancy, uh, we go around. I just want to, real quick, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's so important for us, I think, to take a moment and reflect on that um, because folks often, I think the, the more and more we are divorced from nature, either our connectedness with nature um, through food system, farming, gardening, or connectedness with nature um, by just being outside on a daily basis. Some folks work inside and they have a routine that doesn't allow them that luxury. Um, it's easier to lose our agency as individuals, the less and less we're connected with nature. Um, the more we're dependent on another person to tell us like when the right time to go outside is or when the right time to wear a jacket is or when the right time to buy food is instinctually like we've had these connections with nature based off of the regions that we've lived in you know our heritage our ancestry and the more and more we're we're taking away from that the less we are connected to again our ancestors and the ways of life that are universal for all of us they differ of course by region but um that that connected um, kind of intricacy with nature is in, it's instinctual and even in mexico city like you'd mentioned there's um you'll have to correct me on the name it's Xochimilco. There's mm -hmm. a there's floating gardens that have been there since time immemorial now, and uh, they continue to persist not only because they were well built and well designed and integrated with nature, but because they're stewarded by people who understand that connection with our systems and with our heritage and with our seasons. So it's it's an essential process for us to identify not only the fact that we are still a part of nature, but that we've been taken away from it. And also to re-engage with it. I think that's something that we do in our work naturally by reminding students of um, the importance of just being outside, being in nature, the peace that comes from that. So I really appreciate you bringing that up, Nancy. I'm going to take away one minute from your time, just express this real quickly. Um, and that's a, a clear example of what I was, what I see myself finding and struggling with. Um, I grew up in Mexico City, but I never was in contact with nature. I know Xochimilco. I know the stories. I've been there. But it was out there as an adult, never as a kid, never understanding the the actually being in contact with nature like that. Um, and so going to nature is like actually an excursion, like a, a family trip, and maybe once a year, maybe just for a couple of hours. And so, um, yeah, and so that speaks about priorities. That speaks about, you know, Mexico City or any work, third world country or any communities that struggle with survival. It's just that the mindset is, oh, we have to get food on the table. We have to work. And and that is more important than, than 
than anything else. Um, and so thank you for bringing that up too. Uh, I we got ten minutes left. I just want to make sure that we cover all the areas that you wanna you wanna express and any other projects that you wanna share. So go for it. Hmm. Well, Joanna, don't we have a party coming up soon? Did we talk about that yet? <laughs> yeah, sure. I wanted I wanted to invite anybody um, who believes in the work that we're doing, increasing access to outdoor environmental education in South King County. We have a gala coming up March 16th. We'll have a live raptor encounter. We have uh, amazing desserts by Renton Technical College and uh, a really fun way to connect with your neighbors and Berrien and Renton, especially coming out of COVID. So uh, that's March 16th. It'd be fun to see you there, environmentalsciencecenter.org to find tickets. Yeah. And just to remind folks, as we kind of, uh, kind of wrap up, just to check our website, um, if you are interested in anything ESC related, um, we have an incredible Instagram page run by Katie Kashmerik, who will be here on the radio channel um, in the near future. But uh, please, please stay connected with us through our Instagram page and through our website. Um, and probably my favorite, come down to the center. We're, we're always willing to say what's up, um, walk folks around and chat about things on the beach, but um, just make space for one another. So um, please, please, please use this as a resource. Um, email us, um, reach out to us with uh, questions, even concerns. Um, yeah, it's, it's, our, it's our, our privilege to be able to work in the community. So just want to make sure we're connecting when we can. And talking about um, being able to connect to each other, uh, we will be having, and we are so lucky, and I think everyone agrees with, will agree with me, we're so lucky that we'll be able to collaborate with you on uh, later on in an exhibit. We don't have all the information yet. We don't have all the logistics down, but we're trying to have that conversation and how are we going to be able to do this? And more than anything, how do we cross fields and, and, and explore new ways of or, or engaging with the communities? That is what we hear. It is like, we offering a stage and, and light and microphone and, and basically asking everyone use the space, use the stage, use as as you need to use it to 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 reach out to to as many communities as possible. Um, and it's always been a pleasure to welcome people and take ownership for them to take ownership of the space. And we are not here to control the narratives. We are not here to. I'm sorry for any museum people listening to this. We are not going to be a curators at all, quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, you are the curators. You are the ones who are expressing and take ownership on your own story. Um, yeah, in, in, the, in the museum field, there is this concept that we have a label writer, you know, that, that writes all the content on the exhibit. So we have a curator who defines in what photos and what is how we're going to be presenting a story to the public. We don't do that here. Um there's been several people from the museum field that coming over, like, oh, your your exhibit drives your drive us crazy because you hear many different voices in the space. And I say, exactly. That's exactly <laughs> the point. Exactly. That is exactly that why we're doing this. Is because the community is not one voice, it's not the museum's voice, it is your voices. And so it is a pleasure to to open up the space for everyone who would like to express themselves. I do hope that you feel comfortable with us and come up with ideas on what else can we do together. Um, we are not the, I would like to say that we are a little bit outside of the box when it comes to museums. <laughs> and so take advantage of that and have fun. And once again, thank you so much for allowing us to do this interview with you. And and I hope everyone who listened to it understand how cool they are and how awesome they are and how their organization is just beautiful. And it just just please support him. Uh, support him in the in the gala and the programs. Visit, be curious, uh, scratch your head and like, what is this? I got that got my attention. Just go with them. Just explore what they have to to share, and and hopefully you take something beautiful back with you. So, once again, thank you so much for allowing us to do this interview. And yeah, any any last thing you want to say? Or you good? Mm, no last words. Thank you, Nancy. That was a beautiful conclusion. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> add on to that thank you so much for having us really enjoyed this opportunity well, thank you and everyone else out there i hope we see you back or welcome back again thank you bye bye our highline voices 106.5 kqwz lp fm we envision ourselves sitting at a round table 
where no one is the leader and stories are heard respectfully, regardless of gender, age, sexual orientation, disabilities, or ethnicity. We want to embrace our differences and similarities. We are creating a place where visitors can connect with the stories and each other. Our mission is, we collect, preserve, and tell the stories of the Highline region and its people. We want to extend our mission outside the walls of the museum. Our Highline Voices represents us all, honoring our past, celebrating our present, and uniting to cultivate our future. This project allows us to reach out to demographics who might be unable to visit the museum. People with disabilities, low-income families, people who don't trust museums, and more. In partnership, we are launching a locally programmed new radio station at the museum, featuring recorded and live Highlines heritage, history, culture, arts, and more. Are you interested in sharing your story? Email director at highlandmuseum.org.